Welcome everyone. Um, we'll let everybody trickle in and we'll start here in about a minute or two. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from. Okay, so we got Sydney, Minnesota, I think, Arizona, Oregon, the Bay Area, New York, Germany. Great. Egypt, hello, Sarah from Egypt. Ooh, London, Arizona, perfect. All right, so we'll let everybody introduce themselves in the chat. And I guess um, as everybody keeps joining, I can just start. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're thrilled to be hosting this webinar with our esteemed partners at AWS. Over the next hour, you'll hear from cyberspace expert, Tom Soderstrom. He's the director, chief technologist at worldwide at AWS. But first, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Victoria Moser. I am the program coordinator here at Girls in Tech. And I would like to kick off the conversation by quickly introducing Girls in Tech. Girls in Tech was founded in 2007 by Adriana Gascoigne. We are a nonprofit organization working to eliminate the gender gap in tech. We have over 100,000 members and 50 chapters around the world. And we believe that tech meets people from all skills and backgrounds, no matter what area of tech you are interested in, whether you're a developer, a marketer, a designer, a project manager, it doesn't matter to us. We offer education and experiences to help people feel inspired, empowered, confident, and prepared to pursue modern careers. And we accomplish this by providing a supportive community and offering skill training and mentorship. And we aim to see every woman accepted, confident, valued in tech. So we want to see these happen just as they are. Um, now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Tom. He is a director, chief technologist worldwide at AWS Public Sector. And in this role, he advises public sector executives, CTOs, and AWS leader, leaders by identifying, evolving, and sharing emerging technology trends, business models, and patterns that will help solve deep technology problems at scale. One of those trends includes advanced experimentation with uh, technologies such as quantum computing, blockchain, IoT, and all implementations of AI. In the past, he's also served as IT chief technology an innovation officer at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he supported innovative space missions and emerging trends and mentored the next generation of IT and space explorers. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to attempt the biggest stunt of all, trying to get PowerPoint to work. So let's try it. Do we have liftoff? Can you see the slides? We're looking yes, we good. can come. Okay, how about that? My work here is done. Uh, so there was a lot of words there. What it really means is how is tech gonna affect us in the future? And more importantly, how is it gonna affect you and how can you affect tech? So that's like the overall story here. And uh, one of the most exciting places to be today is in space. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what is the new space economy and why should you care? Why, how will you benefit? And uh, your Buffy, uh, my co-host here, Buffy is uh, an expert in space and she's also an expert in technology and cryptography and you name it. Uh, and where are you today, Buffy? Uh, today I am in Bremen, Germany, supporting the Space Tech Expo. I'll be doing a panel tomorrow on securing space. So, uh, I guess the overarching thing is there's a lot of opportunity here and uh, we'll be answering questions. I'll give most of this presentation, Buffy could do it too, but she's in Germany, so we just weren't sure. Uh, so the, I'm gonna have four questions that I'll try to answer. Why should we and you care about space and why now? And I'm especially happy to be able to talk to women because uh, there aren't many there. and There's a tremendous opportunity 
And that's where Buffy can really help. Um, I go to a lot of hackathons and it's been usually male and I'm seeing it grow now with more female. And we need, we need you to care about space. And I'll tell you why in a second. So who can benefit? I'm gonna go into a little bit about the people and the roles. And then I'm gonna show some examples, lots of pretty pictures and fun things. And then what should we do next? And I'll leave time for questions. So in reality, this is why we care about space. We have to answer these big questions. Uh, are we alone? Is there life out there? Uh, can we find Earth 2.0 if we need to one day export humanity? Is or was there life on Mars? Where did the universe come from? And how do we protect Mother Earth? Uh, by the way, just a check. Uh, you, you can see the entire slides. Yes, you can. I can move that window. Good. Um, so those are the questions that children have asked their parents for millennia. Uh, what's out there? Are there people out there? Uh, I think with your help, we're going to be able to answer these questions because the technology has come so far and we're now moving forward. I used to talk about IT decades. An IT decade, you might think, how long is that? It's actually three years and it's shrinking. It's probably like two and a half now. So very, very, 10 human years is like two computer years. So it's going faster and faster. And that's where you come in to try to answer some of these great questions. So first question, why space and why now? Well, we're entering a really exciting and daring new space age. I've been in space for a long time. As uh, uh, Victoria mentioned, I was chief technology innovation officer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. When I started that, the only ones that really cared about space was NASA, the Soviet Union, the big countries. It's not like that anymore. Uh, in fact, it's everywhere. It's the big countries and I'll go over that, but it's also a bunch of startups and they're doing exciting things. So the space industry is rapidly growing and transforming. Uh, we're also now going, sending humans back into space. And hopefully you saw, or at least heard of Artemis successful launch from NASA this morning. They're going to circle the moon and come back with the objective of sending the first man and woman to the South Pole of the, the moon uh, by 2024 was last I heard. So it's, it's moving fast. Uh, the, um, in other words, also satellites, and I'll talk a lot about this. So why space and why now? Because it's happening now. And of course, tourism. <laughs> You've seen a lot of Captain Kirk actually went to space, as did Jeff Bezos, Branson. So call it the Billionaires Club. Uh, I think it's great because it increases the interest in space. And as you'll see, costs come down. So one day it'll be your turn too. Would you go? Would you dare to go into space? I would in a heartbeat. So let's look at what actually happens here. Uh, this is a big business disruption. Uh, this, the trends are, it's a 15th, cost of 15th, roughly 15 to 20th of the cost that it did 15 years ago to launch a satellite, to build it, to launch it, to take the data down, to track it. And you don't have to own anything. It's, it's like cloud computing where you don't actually have to own the data center. You just have a laptop with a Wi-Fi and you pay for what you use. The same thing is happening in space. That's what makes it so exciting. And there are 8,000 satellites roughly now in orbit and another of those only half about active. We're sending up another 20,000 satellites in just a few years. So half of them roughly is gonna provide internet access. A third of them will provide um, Earth science, trying to protect Mother Earth. And the remaining is going to be about business. Um, lots of business opportunities, things that we haven't even thought about yet. And venture capital is investing. I mean, right now we're seeing a slowdown in the economy. And believe me when I tell you, uh, the time to create a startup is in a slowdown. Because by the time the economy ramps back up, you're up and running and you're successful. So think of, if you haven't done a startup, now's the time. Um, also, the interest in space is huge. 10 new national space agencies were created since 2018. So it isn't, uh, I see we have a lot of people from across the world here. You can all participate uh, because it's a global participation game, not the big countries uh, observing game. So you can see how it's gone. The launch costs have gone down from $85,000 per kilo 
to just a few dollars in the future. That enables a lot of things. So we're gonna give some examples. Uh, global climate change, it's something we all care about. We have to save our planet. And you can go to NASA's website here and you can see in real time the data. How can you see that? Because it's coming from space. The only way you can actually measure it over time climate change is from space. And people are starting to do that. So that's one, help save our planet. And a lot of companies are signing in to, onto the climate pledge as has AWS and Amazon where Buffy and I and Anand work and we're proud of it. So your opportunity here is to think about how can we save our planet using data from space. Here's an example. So as, I, as you saw in the previous slide, $2 billion climate change, that's a big, big money. Here is a website from Australia called Blue Dot. And what they're looking at is 7,000 bodies of water. And they're looking at the ones at risk and they measure it all the time. They're using something that I'm very proud of called Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative or ASDI and open data. So all of this is about open source, open data, make it available to everybody, democratize space. So it's completely automated. They take the data down from a Sentinel satellite and the name of the satellite, and they're able to process it and show it. And it costs them $6 a month. The total cost of everything, including the satellite data is $100 a month. This is really having a global impact on a shoestring budget. So don't think that it's only the big budget that can help make a difference. Everybody can. And this is, I think is a good example. So how do you get the data down? And uh, if you have any questions about this type of stuff, Buffy is the superstar here. She works on the ground station and demonstrates it all the time. So what does it mean? A ground station is really an antenna. An antenna takes the data down from space. Currently it's radio frequency but the optical comm is coming fast. So it's like having a big uh, laser beam. Well, it is a big laser beam into space, much, much faster. So that's moving faster. And you don't have to own it anymore. When I started, NASA was the one who had it. This is the managed ground station service. So it means you can just rent time on an antenna and you can get your data down. Uh, contrast that with building one for $100 million, uh, which we did in the Deep Space Network. Uh, they're different antennas for different purposes, but you can use it. And so it's a new sunrise for the entire space industry. And they're global. So here's an example. We used to think an uh, Earth satellite goes around the Earth every 90 minutes or so, and it measures things on the ground. But you're limited, if you have one antenna, to get data down every 90 minutes. Now you have antennas everywhere. So you could have a swarm of spacecraft all reacting in real time to something. And I'll give you a few examples when we get to the examples, but it's a completely different world. And we need programmers, we need engineers, we need business people, we need everything to expand it. And we need internet access. So Project Kuiper, Starlink, OneWeb, many of them are sending up satellites to provide this broadband access so that people who have never had access before can participate. It is this democratization of brain power. People who never, who are really bright and interested, and I'll give some example of what's going on in Africa, for example, and across the world, of people now being able to put their smarts to use for space. So it's, it's really a fantastic opportunity. So I'm gonna mention those 20,000 satellites. It's really the, Kuiper, Starlink, OneWeb, and a few others that are putting up all these satellites. So you will have access to the internet wherever you are at all times. That's coming. So now let's spend just a little bit of time on this slide. Who can benefit? So when you look at the space economy, it's, it's benefiting all the way from governments and all the way into individuals. So governments are looking for targeted assistance first responders. And unfortunately, global climate change has a lot of extreme weather coming with it. So there's many more fires, there is floods. Uh, so the disaster response, they need satellite data. Uh, and they also are looking at governments. I mentioned 10 new space agencies. 
it's a great ambassador. Space and global climate change affects us all. So you see a lot of partnerships growing from governments. The space agencies are looking at new science and new private par public partnerships. We're seeing that really grow up fast. So a space agency may have a big budget, but they partner out a lot of it to private industry. It's a very healthy uh, environment and it's growing fast. So think about yourself, where do you fit here? Legacy space companies, uh, companies like Lockheed Martin, getting competition from companies like Maxar, um, and so that you can have the legacy space companies usually give contracts to the smaller companies that contract to the governments. Lots of startups, hardware, software, uh, orchestration, analytics, AI, ML collaboration. What's really the thing that's missing here is the ideas. If you have an idea, you can make it happen at a reasonable cost. Universities are forming space programs. They're building antennas. They're uh, outsourced to actually run the antennas. Business is using data from space. Lots of focus on farming and water. Then there's a citizen scientist. They can actually sit at home, apply their smarts, analytics, augmenting, using open source, etc., to really participate uh, and make money. The citizens, of course, benefit. We have a climate climate crisis. Uh, we have food and water supply, and uh, it this will help to provide early warning. And the industry IT, we're talking about big data. Do you have any idea how big this data is? Think about this for a second. How much data are we talking about? We're talking about uh, over well over 100 zettabytes. What's a zettabyte? That is a big number. It's a one with a whole bunch of zeros. So somebody can check me on it. I think it's like 24 zeros, but it's a big number. So what does it mean? It means that every human on earth, and we just hit 8 billion, by the way, it, every human on earth is generating 1.6 megabytes per second. That's a lot of data. Not all of that is stored, but it will be, uh, and it will be processed. And that's where the cloud comes in because you can store the data inexpensively and everybody can access it. So we have data scientists and all of the things you can see here. AI is a big deal. That's really an opportunity for you. And roboticists, but new job titles will emerge. What title is missing? Moon geologist, uh, Mars explorer, where it's not a spacecraft, but it's a person on the surface. So think about what titles are missing and what would you like to be? And, and it's growing this fast that you could. So let's give some examples. Uh, I'm just gonna pause and look at the comment here. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm gonna give lots of time for question and answers, so we'll wait. Uh, okay, so I'll answer these questions in a minute. But some examples. Have you heard of James Webb Space Telescope? So now we're, we're starting out at the beginning of the Big Bang and we're going in towards the Earth. So this is Spitzer, great uh, space telescope and the same image from James Webb that just uh, was launched. It's sitting at 1 million miles away from Earth, and it's going to detect many, many new uh, exoplanets. It can see into about 400 million years after the Big Bang, which is uh, amazing. So track that one. Um, going a little closer into our solar system, Europa is a planet or a moon of Jupiter that has a big ice sheet and inside that ice sheet is uh, lakes of water. If there's any place we're gonna find life, we think it's in the, those lakes of Europa. So there is a funded mission to go and uh, explore it, uh, find the landing place and one day drop in a lander that will melt itself through the ice or drill through to take a look at it. And if you think about how would you detect if there is life, there's no people there. How would you know if there's life? Think about it for a second. Well, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory developed some AI that looks at these microbes and if something is moving against the trends, if it's a, not random, then it's probably self-propelled. So that's how we could detect life. So lots of opportunities to think this through. The antennas I'm showing are the big antennas. They're 70 meters across and they exist at NASA. Uh, the, uh, the antennas, 
or specialized for special purpose. And I think that's really the key. Of course, Mars coming from JPL, that was my favorite. Um, I wanted to take you on to see what it looks like inside JPL's clean room. And it's a clean room because they have, uh, they don't want to introduce bacteria that we later find in space thinking we found life. Uh, and uh, so this is the Perseverance rover. And when you think about space, you think about the big things, but to build the big things, you need small things, like you need something to measure how clean is the air. And uh, the old one was about roughly 82,000, about $100,000, and it measures the particulate count. We built one when I was there using IoT, really cheap sensors, uh, internet of things, and just generate a lot of data for a hundredth of the cost. So now what they said, okay, build us a hundred. So we did. And now what you can see is you can see the airflow and the particulates inside and outside the air filters. So now you can have a digital twin of a clean room to build better spacecraft for really inexpensive. And that's the way we should think about this. What can we do getting started? And this is the rover being put together. Uh, hopefully this works over Zoom. Uh, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing. It's up on Mars now. It's called Curiosity. It's called uh, Perseverance. And this is what it looks like. So this is several billion dollar uh, rover, but there are so many pieces that go into it, so many opportunities. It's looking for signs of past life and it's collecting samples that it drops behind. Uh, or stores in its belly for now, and then we'll drop behind for a future rover to pick up, send up to an orbiter, send back to Earth so that the geologists can uh, really study it. Because even with all our technologies, the humans are still much brighter than the robots. The geologists can find in minutes what a robot takes hours or days to do. Now, it also had a little friend, uh, the Mars helicopter. And the Mars helicopter, worked. It was an experiment, crazy idea, but now it's flying on Mars and it can pop up over a hill and tell the rover if it's worth going there. So all of a sudden these experiments is going to expand the business of space. Let's come back to Earth. So we're really enabling the next generation of space builders. Satellite enabled architecture, defense, national security, Earth observation, Smart cities and digital twins have a lot to do with this. At, uh, I once saw the uh, Ericsson uh, and Volvo had partnered and for the bicyclists, they had a helmet and the helmet would vibrate if there was a car coming around the corner. That's just clever thinking and it's enabled because the data is in the cloud. Um, the key to everything, I'm, I'm thinking, is that right? I think it's right, is water. So water is the key to life on earth and in space. And NASA is sending up these, uh, these satellites very shortly. Uh, SWAT is going on uh, the 12th of December and NISAR uh, about a year later. And they're going to circle the earth every 12 days or so. And they will look for water, whether it's in small reservoirs or in tied up in ice or, so what they'll be able to do is to predict water shortage or floods, and that will help us a lot. The key here is for us was they collect a lot more data than everything, 100 times more data than uh, anything that Jet Propulsion Laboratory had ever collected before. So stored in the cloud and all of a sudden everybody can use it and that's the key. So you will be able to use all of this data uh, from home and that's gonna be key. A company called Capella Space circles the earth uh, with a lot of satellites and provides data that businesses use. So all of a sudden, if you can combine different types of data together, you can build things that never existed before, only limited by your idea. And that's where the startups are really growing. This is called EXI. It's the warning for the bush in Australia, and they can detect wildfires within a few minutes. And so they can alert, they have satellites, they process the data on the ground. They can alert uh, first responders that there's a fire brewing. But what if you could do that in space? 
And that's why this is all moving. It's moving into the satellites. Now you could detect it in seconds. And uh, for the fast moving wildfire, minutes matter. So what should we, or actually, what should you do next? Participate. Uh, I mentioned the billion dollar rover. Uh, this is a copy of it in open source that uh, we built at JPL so that high school students would learn how to do programming, robotics, science, uh, and electrical engineering. And then we had hackathons and we had uh, one for reinforcement learning that people could actually learn, teach the rover how to drive on Mars in a simulated environment. But this is, if you are of an interest in this, go to these hackathons, uh, go on open source, look at the open source rover at JPL. Uh, it has 7,000 stars on open source last I looked. So it's still, it survived us pulling out and having the community uh, maintain it. And here she is visiting her mother uh, at JPL. And uh, you can and you can actually talk to her. Uh, it's Alexa enabled. So it's a great uh, way of reaching people with different ways because the AI is so powerful now. So what should you do? Sponsor and participate in startups, hackathons, challenges, anything you can think of. Uh, we sponsored, AWS sponsored the Space Accelerated Challenge in 2021. There were 10 winners uh, and they are doing really well, really well. Uh, and then in 2022, we did it again and there were 10 winners. The interesting thing in 2022, it was very global. In 2021, it was mostly Europe and the US, and now it's all over the world. The African Earth Observation Challenge uh, is very inventive. Uh, it's a scrappy environment and they come up with so many innovations. Then we did the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiatives Open Innovation Challenge, uh, and there are six winners there. The key here is, if, and this is why I'm so proud of this ASDI, if you are storing data for the public good, you can store it for free. In fact, we will pay you to change, to modify it so that other people can use it. But you are, you just have to maintain it. But you are free to make money of applications that is using that data. So I think that's where we have to go for the public good and for business and space is going there in spades. Wrapping up here, the new technology trends, and I can talk more about this uh, in Q&A, but basically there's a lot happening. The environmental, social, and governance is a key where it's really about sustainability. Uh, com countries want their own cloud, lots of advanced technology experiments, and that's where your opportunity is, I think. If you're at all interested in quantum, the ones we see people wanting in the enterprises, quantum computing, blockchain, uh, networking like 5G, and low code. And AWS has, uh, of course, uh, opportunities to experiment with all that at low cost. So do other companies. The, the key here is to experiment. Uh, when some people, I'm at Caltech today, uh, I could have been at home, but when you work with other people, you have to think it through. Mixed reality, is the metaverse real or not? Well, I don't think it's gonna be where the avatars party. I think it's going to be where the, you do real work. And I'll give you an example. Productive at the edge. Think about space. That's the ultimate edge. Uh, so everything needs to be productive as you move out, even disconnected. And robotics. Robots are everywhere. And cobots, being humans and robots working together, has never been easier. So the key to all of this is smarter everything. It, a city is not just built to be smart. It's built to become smarter but on usage, more data, faster network, uh, more interesting applications. So these are the important ones. Let's say you were sitting on the metaverse and you have your augmented reality glasses on. You get alerted that a robot has a problem. Uh, you click on it in your factory and the digital twin is showing you that there is a leak. So with your digital twin, you just turn the valve and it shuts it off in the factory. So you have digital twins reporting to digital twins reporting to digital twins. If I haven't said digital twins enough, pay attention. That's one of the biggest trends. So if you're interested in that at all, uh, you will have a big future. We just have to expand our belief system. 
uh, we have to believe that Alexa could answer or Google Home could answer anything we want. Uh, and it can. It's just a matter of using this natural language interface to in increasing the complex IT system, make it easy so that humans can benefit from it and share. So that's how I think we're going to answer these big questions uh, in my lifetime. May, may I live a long time? But I think it's you're going to make it happen. And uh, one day, if we need to find Earth 2.0, where would we go? Well, we've actually found 5,000 exoplanets so far. When I say we, it's the global we, the world. And uh, about 50 or so are Earth-like, meaning they could have running water. They're about the size of an Earth to a Jupiter. Um, and where will humanity be? And will you help us get there if we couldn't redirect that big asteroid if it ever hits us? And by the way, nothing is near, so nothing to worry about. Uh, but that's, uh, I just want to thank you for your time. And we have lots of time for Q&A. Uh, I wanted to really hear the questions and have the discussions. So uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm SoderTom at Amazon.com. And uh, Buffy is uh, also here. You can, you can type it in. And uh, everybody. So I think I'm going to turn the slides off uh, and we'll go into Q&A. Good. So uh, let's see. Buffy, have you looked at any questions that you want to answer? I have. Um, so there is an actual Q&A box. There is a lot of questions that sort of center around what should you focus on or what should you do or what languages should you prepare if you mm -hmm. want to get into the space industry? Good. Do you want to take that one and I'll add to it? Uh, sure. Um, I'll, I'll certainly start. Um, first off, the space industry is global. Right. So like Tom was saying, when you look at the 19, you know, 50s and 60s, space was run by basically two big governments. Um, even as late as 2003, I believe it is, there was only three um, countries that could go into space independently without using, you know, other resources, um, each other's rockets, et cetera, et cetera. Now we have over 10,000 space companies looking to do something in space. So you almost can't fail, right? Um, so whether you are looking at big data to go ahead and analyze that vast amount of data that's going to come down, whether you're looking at engineering because you want to actually build the stuff that goes up, whether you're looking at physics because you want to come up with new ideas for fuel and propulsion, it's all going to be there. Um, I do have like a, a personal feeling, and, and this just isn't for space. I, I think this is for the earth all up. But when you look at things like the climate pledge that uh, Tom talked about, you know, our carbon footprint, how are we going to save mother earth, et cetera, et cetera. When you start to look at things like renewables, or you start to look at things that are really far away, like a satellite, and you start to, you know, think about how am I going to store power on this? I think battery technology is going to have a huge play in the next coming decades. Um, so I would focus there. And as far as languages are concerned, um, I don't necessarily think that there is a, a space language. Uh, I guess I could comment that at the Space Tech Bremo, at Bremen and at uh, Paris Space Week, it's all done in English, um, but there are so many different people there that um, I, I think it's just nice to hear all the different languages. Um, next year for the um, International Aeronautical Conference, the IAC conference, it's going to actually be held at um, Baku, Azerbaijan, right? Mm -hmm. So um, literally a global economy. So I want to just share the thing about English. Uh, so I grew up in Sweden. I came to the US when I was 19 and never even thought about space, didn't speak English when I came. Uh, so now when I go back to Sweden, a lot of the words I don't know. I don't know the computer changed. I didn't know the computer words. I didn't know the Swedish, the space words. So I go and I take a word and I just, English word, and I make it sound Swedish. And nine <laughs> times out of 10, I'm right. <laughs> so, but the English is really the global language. Uh, and I've discovered that a lot of the terms, they, everybody's using the English terms. 
So while I happen to love cultures and I love languages, uh, the language of space really seems to be English and high tech. Um, but as far as programming languages, it seems to me when you look at the real time, hardcore things that are done, uh, it's really C and C++. Um, and when you look at how to get things done quickly, it seems to be uh, uh, Python and anything that has to do with uh, the, the browser. And there's a lot of innovations there. So I wouldn't, once you learn a few languages if you're a programmer, that's just semantics. It's thinking like a programmer that's interesting. Uh, the other thing is what I love about the new generation, newer than me, uh, and I hired a lot of uh, young people at JPL. Uh, they go first and look to see if there's something they can reuse instead of like we did, just create it from scratch. So the speed is much faster. So if you're gonna do something, chances are that it already exists. So go look for it and then use whatever language they used. You, you'll learn it real fast. Um, I saw one that, that's kind of fun here that said, uh, what's the most exciting thing we've seen in space? Right now, it's like asking me who are my, which of my children is my favorite. <laughs> and by the way, that's an easy answer if you're a parent. It's always the one not asking. <laughs> oh, your <laughs> sister is, of course. Uh, so uh, it's, they've discovered a lot of water on Mars and uh, underneath the surface. Uh, the first time they discovered it was the, the rover uh, broke, one of the wheels broke and it was dragging behind and they saw this white glistening and it was ice. But they discovered lakes. Um, it, that's exciting. Uh, I'm really excited about James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, it's discovering things we've never seen before. Um, and I'm excited about all of the innovations that are happening around global climate change. Let me give you one. Um, XCBs, um, they, it's a startup, uh, I think they're out of the UK, and they do uh, augmented reality for, for first responders. And so when the first responder comes, there's smoke, they can't see anything, but they put their AR glasses on and now they can see the street signs. It overlays on top and how many people should be in this building, et cetera. Those type of innovations uh, are just coming fast and furious and it's wonderful. Let's see, so the first one, uh, oh, good question. If you were advising young women in college or high school who are passionate about the space industry, that, oh, that's the foreign language. Yeah, English. Uh, the next one is, and by the way, what I love, love, love about the European Space Agency, I've been there a couple of times, uh, they speak all kinds of languages. So they will address the person in their language and they answer something quick and then they switch to English. So it's a politeness thing. It's an emotion, uh, emotional quotient uh, intelligence. So I think that's a good way of doing it. Um, uh, but Buffy, do you wanna start the second one? Can you see that? Thanks for taking the time today. Are there particular yeah. areas of space industry you see more opportunities, need for startups? Are there any existing startups you think are particularly promising? So like I mentioned before, I think anything to do with battery tech is going to be extremely interesting. I love all the startups that are thinking about how do we standardize and start to network space. So there was another question about, you know, can we talk about like what does cyber look like for space? And space has always been thought of as this very, very remote area that no one can get to. And that that's kind of what security looked like was it's so far away that it doesn't matter. Um, but Space is going to get closer and closer to what your cell phone or Wi-Fi plan looks like, where you're just walking around on your cell phone and you switch from tower to tower and you switch modulation types. You might even switch standards from something like an LTE to a 5G. And it's all seamless to you. The phone is just doing that. And space is going to be so integrated into our lives that it's going to look exactly like that. But once space gets that integrated, the cyber attacks look like what cyber attacks look like now, right? 
So you'll have man in the middle, you'll have hacking, you'll have viruses. These are things that the space community really hasn't had to think of before and are going to be big coming up in the future. Good. No, I think that that's excellent. And I would say anything having to do with global climate change is an easy way to get started because the data exists and it's really about analyzing the data and combining different types of data. So if you're a data scientist, analytics, AI type person, that's an area to get started. Um, and I think the uh, funding is going to go a lot more than we see today. And if you're from Europe and especially the Nordics, uh, there's a lot of funding for that. They really, we all care, but they care and they put the money where their mouth is, <laughs> if that's the way you say it. All right, looking at the next one. Good question. Awesome questions here. Uh, and what we can do, by the way, is I can share the startups uh, with you. Uh, and then I, I have cut them from the deck to keep it short. Uh, but there are some really exciting ones. Uh, the ones that, the 10 that won our challenge in 2021 and 2022, for instance, good startups. Yeah. Um, well, this industry needs people from all types of backgrounds. What types of backgrounds do you get excited about right now? What about education, internships, practice experiences? Let me tell you what I told my daughters um, and I've practiced it since. The, you get, you get your interviews from your college, you get your job from your internships. So if you're in college, focus on getting a good internship and focus on getting perhaps different ones so you figure out what you'd like to do. I hosted thousands of interns. Uh, many of them became employees who would then bring in the interns for next year. And that's how we grew our uh, looking at emerging technology. Uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory is a fantastic place to do internships. They do 10, 10,000, a thousand interns every year. So are the other NASA agencies. Uh, so are other space companies. Uh, so I would, I would look at the focusing on the internships and the careers. I'm gonna ask you to answer to Buffy, but the career, if the perfect, if you're a techie, the perfect place is AI and cybersecurity. That combination is you get a job anywhere, not just space, but you have to be interested in it. That's really the key. And the other last piece for me is business degrees have nothing to do with space when I grew up, zero. Now it's a huge opportunity because of all these startups and private partnerships, et cetera. So. Buffy, anything to add? Yeah, I'll add a, you know, just a little uh, anecdote um, about my career, um, honestly, which is um, I have degrees in chemistry and economics, which have nothing to do with space or cryptography. Um, I was purposely recruited by the National Security Agency, by the NSA, because I did not have a degree in math or computer science <laughs> because they found while the two skill areas that a cryptologist needs or a crypt analyst needs are math and computer science, that the people who actually studied those fields had such a narrow way of looking at the problem mm -hmm. that they weren't actually able to break the codes. And so they wanted people who could think outside the box, but who could learn math and computer science. So I would say that the biggest thing really is to have a passion for what you want to do. And that definitely ties into the internships. Like if you show interest in something and a willingness to learn, I think that's going to go greater than having, you know, the, a certain set of degrees on your resume. That, that's a good point. Uh, in fact, when I did, uh, I did a startup inside Jeff Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, and we then looked afterwards, who had we hired? Of course, one of our things was analytics. So we looked at that and it was inversely proportional to their grades. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, it, we ended up hiring the self-starters, the people with a passion, the people who wanted to get things done quickly. Um, and by the way, don't think that you have to come in with big degrees to do this. Uh, contrary to, uh, to, uh, 
buffet story, nobody wanted me. I couldn't get a job. I was a biologist. <laughs> and I ended up going to a company and said, if I work for free, will you hire me? And they did. And so that's how I started my career and eventually got into JPL and learned how to program and all that. But a lot of it is just chance. Take an opportunity, but try it. Don't, don't shy away from an opportunity, I would say. Uh, let's see. Oh, <laughs> what role does big data play in the space business? A lot. Because uh, for the first time, we can actually look at all this data because it's, co it's co-located, or at least you can bring it together in the cloud. So the cloud is the big enabler to all of this. It's not a goal in itself, but it's how you can make it possible. So if you are a startup uh, or you're working with somebody, try to put the data in the cloud and have other people add value to it, or you can get their data. So we're ASDI, as I mentioned, uh, has an open data in Amazon, has over 100 petabytes right now of data, broken into 337 different data sets so that you can focus on the things that you care about. One data set may be earth, may, one may be water, atmosphere, et cetera. But big data plays a big role. Where I see it going is, you take the big data, you move it into the cloud. Now you can do machine learning and analytics on it, perfect the algorithms, and then push it out to the edge where it can run even in space. So it doesn't have to go back to Earth all the time, but it can actually do the processing. Because uh, once you've perfected the machine learning algorithm, it takes less processing power. So anything to add, Buffy? Um. I would say that um, big data and the analytics that are going to be used for big data are going to be used in ways that we never thought of. So yeah. there's, a, you know, there's the climate change stuff now. There's looking at pictures. There's determining things that are going on with the Earth. But you know, one of you know, we talked a little bit about the uh, Mars rover, and one of the interesting things about the Mars rover is in order to send it a command. You know, it, it takes a long time to actually get, you know, to and from Earth. And so JPL actually made the Mars rover with artificial intelligence. So based on the tasking that it had, it could determine what the next tasking could be without actually getting tasking. So it's it, it's a, a new use case for the training that you would get in big data. Yeah, and it's, so I think that's a good one about the autonomy, uh, because what we did is we said, okay, rover, you need to get from A to B, but it takes at least eight minutes uh, of round trip light time. So if it gets stuck, it has to handle itself. So it, you would just literally tell it, get from A to B, and it figures out how to do it. And uh, that was with older technology. So it, it's moving fast. Um, how do you determine what opportunities to pursue where there's so many different positions? How did you know that you had to work in the space industry? I didn't. At the time, I was just trying to find a job. <laughs> so, but over time, your passion grows. So I think wherever your passion is, pursue that. And like Buffy said before. Um, how is data, the space industry tackling data storage? And is data storage limitations a concern? That is a super question. When we look at where innovations will come, Buffy is absolutely right about batteries. There's a company called Northvolt in Sweden uh, that I met with, I was so impressed. They are gonna be a game changer. Uh, but the other one is storage. Storage has kind of, in my opinion, stagnated. Um, I mean, we know that we can store gazillion, that's a technical term, bytes <laughs> in a tiny bit of DNA, but it's really expensive and it's hard to get out. So what's gonna happen with storage? Uh, if you are as interested or going to college or anything like that, storage would be one to look at. I, I think it, you look at the trends, sometimes it's compute, sometimes it's databases, sometimes it's storage. Storage has been quiet for a while. Buffy, any thoughts? I was gonna add that um, space actually provides a lot of unique opportunities to think about storage in different ways. So one of the companies that um, I've met with, which just fascinated me, was a company called Lightloop. And they're using lasers in space. So they're basically making a laser loop and they're storing data that way. Hmm. So they're storing it on the laser in a continuously moving stream like this 
just using the properties of free space um, in order not to lose the data. Um, and that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, it, it, wow. it's just cool, right? So. <laughs> Oh, that, that's amazing. Uh, what were they called again? Space Light, light Loop? Like light? L yeah, L-Y-T-E, Light Loop. Okay. Let me see if I can find a... Uh, that's so a cool. Or something that like that. Yeah. Uh, so another question about cybersecurity and space tech. Um, there's a couple of things there. We could talk about that for hours, but we'll, we'll get through the rest of them. One of the key enablers uh, is space. So everybody is going to try to be in space, but be protected about what they share. And uh, I sure hope we will never have a war in space. But if we do, it's gonna be the encryption and the decryption that rules. So encryption and decryption capabilities are hotly contested on earth and in space. And quantum uh, networking, uh, quantum resistant encryption is key. So if you're interested in that at all, that would be a great thing to study because that's growing leaps and bounds. AWS just released that uh, we partnered with Harvard to build a quantum networking lab and research facility in, at Harvard, just like we did with Caltech for quantum computing. Uh, so it's it's a encryption and decryption is gonna be key. Buffy, this is kind of your old world. <laughs> well, and that's the, you know, that's what I was talking about earlier is that, you know, as, as space becomes more and more norm, it's also going to be subject to some of the, the norm attacks. So thinking about new ways to do cryptography is going to be huge in that field. Um, space also, again, sort of like the, the light loop model, just because it has free space, um, allows some unique ways to actually transfer quantum keys. Um, you can't really transfer quantum keys very well using a terrestrial network, but you can do using a space network. Um, so if and when quantum becomes more of the standard for cryptography, again, space is just going to be more integrated than into that sort of um, daily op tempo. Cool. Um, I'm going to share here in a minute. I read a book about a woman who actually was the greatest cryptographer we've ever seen. And uh, it, it's uh, in the 50s. And it's an interesting story because she's a woman in the 50s and she's super smart and she's figuring out the code breaking. So it's a really interesting story. I'll share that in a minute here. But uh, uh, and thanks to her, NSA was created. So Buffy, you had a job for a while. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, how do you prioritize a single initiative in space-based research? Boy, that one is stumping me. I would again focus on the, uh, what can you do quickly? And, and if you think about something long-term, this is the way NASA does it and everybody does a long-term, set out a big, big goal and then iterate to get there. So if you know what your big goal what you're passionate about, then have, find the startups or the companies. And even though we have a downturn in the economy right now, there's a lot of work. Uh, so find one that's working in that space. So you can kind of think about it as jumping, jumping off from one to another. And it could even be with different companies, definitely be the same company, but kind of think about what you think you want to do long-term. Buffy, you have any sage advice there? Where to focus? Uh, not really. I mean, it goes back to passion. Like if I were a policymaker and I was trying to prioritize space right now, I could probably come up with my own personal answers. But I think that there's going to be an infinite number of lists on how to prioritize space because everyone has infinite interest. Um, I will say that the whole uh, you know, uh, climate change thing or how do we protect Mother Earth, it's going to come up. Um, so some of the areas that kind of focus around that. Um, are probably going to be government priorities, at least coming in the future. Yep, I'm just looking. We have a lot of questions. There's some good ones. They're all very good. <laughs> uh, let's see. There's actually so, one in the chat, which is, you know, why is there a surge right now in the 2020s for space? Like, how did this just like sort of pop up? Mm, okay, that's, so there, there are two pieces to that. 
One is greatly renewed interest, and it's related to greatly reduced barriers to entry, greatly reduced costs. So all of a sudden, I mentioned uh, a 20th of the cost. That's 5% of the cost 15 years ago. That's a big number. So all of a sudden, and, and people are building the building blocks. So you can, let's say you want to fly something in space. You don't have to build a spacecraft. You don't have to own a spacecraft. You don't have to own an antenna. You don't have to own a network. All you have to do is find the right partners and partner it. So there is... It's like in the old days when the railroad was built, um, people needed some place to eat. So there were restaurants, et cetera. And it, the people who were clever at the time bought up towns where the railroad was gonna go. And that's kind of where the space industry is right now. It, it's just growing because the infrastructure is growing and all the pieces around it will grow, which makes the infrastructure grow even more. Um, so that's uh, my answer. Um, let's see, do you need to have knowledge of space to work as a data analyst in that field? Buffy's question, the answer was perfect. No. And you learn it so fast and there's so many opportunities. Um, when I hired interns at JPL, um, I would look for two things. Were they learners? Would they be in, were they passionate about learning and were they passionate about space? Because if they weren't passionate about space, I'd only keep them for two years or so, and then they'd move on, take the, what they learned and move on. So um, think about your passions and then pursue those. Um, let's see. Oh, hardware in space. One of the big changes, this is huge, is when you go into space, at least from a jet propulsion laboratory point of view, there's a lot of radiation. Radiations and computers and memory don't get along. It can flip a bit, et cetera. So you program around it by having lots of redundant. Do, do two out of three agree, et cetera, et cetera. What has happened recently is a lot of companies are saying, well, let's just try it. And we did too. Just flew a laptop and put it on the space station and see how long it lasted. And it lasted much, much longer than we thought. So the barriers to entry are coming down. Uh, one of my mentees flew a Linux board in space and that replaced that one kilo replaced 50 kilos. And that's a big change. So I think are the limitations of hardware much less than they used to be, I think. Um, Buffy, any thoughts there? In the past, when you looked at you know the big 60s, again, when you're pouring lots and lots and lots of money into space, space had to be perfect. And so everything was radiation proofed. Now we have a sort of a different economy where we're okay with making iterations with space. We're okay if a laptop fails. We're okay even when a LEO satellite fails, if that LEO satellite only cost you know, thousands of dollars as compared to millions of dollars. Um, so there is a big move to things like radiation tolerant instead of radiation resistant. Yeah, and the fact that you can program around it is the key because you, yeah. you can protect the hardware with software. I love the, this question, so I put it in the chat. Uh, what books do you recommend? Uh, so if you haven't read The Martian by Andy Weir and his newer uh, Hail Mary, uh, fun book, awesome book. And the science is very good, very, very good. Uh, I met Andy and... Uh, he is just as funny as his books portray. So there's no ghostwriting there. So that's those are fun. Buffy, anything from you? What do you think? Any books that you would recommend? Not off the top of my head. So I'll just go with yours. Good. Uh, this was really fun. And uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you for inviting us and asking uh, our opinion. And I want to thank you in advance for helping to answer those big questions. Are we alone? Uh, how we direct the Virgin asteroid and all that. So thank you. See you, Tom. Bye. I also have to leave fairly quickly, but I will address one question that I saw in the chat, which is how do you address overcrowding in space and traffic management, um, which is absolutely 
going to be more and more of a hot topic in space. Um, so I'm actually going to be giving a talk on that during reInvent with two of our customers who are doing amazing work in terms of just trying to track everything that's in space. So those are Leo Labs Incorporated and Kahan Space. So right now there's about six to 8,000 satellites circling around our heads, which is a lot, but it's nothing compared to space junk. When you look at space junk, we're looking at more than 20,000 pieces of debris that's bigger than a softball. And then consider that those are all in orbit and can be traveling up to something like 15 kilometers an hour. So if you're a small LEO satellite or if you're the International Space Station and you get hit by a softball going 15 kilometers an hour, that's not a good day. So as this space economy builds, we're also going to have to build all of the infrastructure and compliance and regulation that we have here today for things like, you know, just automobile traffic. We have it for air traffic control. Um, when you think about it, we have it for the internet. Like we had to think about how are we going to actually regulate where the data goes on the internet and space is going to be no different. Um, so you know, definitely invite you that will, session will be eventually posted to the reInvent YouTube channel. Um, so when that happens, definitely invite you to check that out. And as mentioned earlier, and I will type again, if anyone wants to reach out or have a question for later, that is my email address. I've also been looking at the uh, LinkedIn um, invites coming through. Um, so also happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn. Um, so thank you very much for the session today and for the actual active participation. It was amazing to hear all the great questions coming through. It's always very dry just to give a presentation and, you know, pass on data and have a, a stale audience. This is a, a much better way to do this. And honestly, thank you. Thank you for being who you are and being interested in tech and possibly interested in space. Follow your passion. Don't let anyone tell you no. And if I can ever do anything for any of you, please let me know. Thank you so much, Buffy. It was great having you. Bye, <laughs> everybody. Care, Bye.